Thank you very much. Um, I think I can contribute a little bit to this last discussion also. So we know that um, we've heard a lot about NIVO and PEMBRO and their effects on um, in various types of, of cancers that we've been talking about. But we also have to realize that although they may be the miracle drug of the decade, there are a lot of patients who don't respond to them. And hence, we've got to look for other reasons. Now, tomorrow I'll be talking a little bit about other immune suppressive mechanisms besides just these checkpoint blockade inhibitors, and they were mentioned earlier. But the other reality is, is that even if a tumor is PD-L1 positive, if the T cells aren't PD-1 positive, then it really doesn't matter, and you're not going to have a therapy that's going to be effective. And the other thing to keep in mind is that PD-1 is a marker of activated T cells. So if in the first place the T cells in the patient aren't activated, again, a PD-1 or a PD-L1 therapy isn't going to work. And so what that's led us to do, but I'm not going to be able to show it, is um, the fact that we've been trying to look at ways to actually use or exploit PD-1 blockade at the same time that we try to activate T cells, thinking that PD-1 blockade will be effective if you have activated T cells. And so what I'm simply showing you here, I think everybody already knows, in order to get T cell activation, you have to have activation of the T cell through the T cell receptor and a co-stimulatory signal through CD28. And once that T cell is then activated, it's going to become PD-1 positive. And obviously, if the tumor or the antigen presenting cell um, expresses, P uh, expresses PD-L1, then you're going to get apoptosis, energy, and exhaustion. And you're, whoa, let's try this. OK, and then you're going to get blocking of T cell proliferation. You're not going to get IL-2. You're not going to get interferon gamma or any of the other things that you want. So the other thing that happens in terms of PD-1 expression is, is that you get downregulation of the T cell receptor. So even if your T cells were activated, they're not going to be able to react to the tumor because they're not going to have a receptor to recognize it. And what's little known, what's less well known is that PDL1 can also do what we call reverse signaling and actually bind to CD80 on a T cell and cause tolerance that way. And that's an activation mechanism that's been very well studied in, um, in autoimmunity, but really hasn't been addressed yet in the tumor setting. So what we thought was that CD80, which actually Arlene Sharp's group recognized about eight years ago, also binds to PDL1 as well as binding to CD28 and to CTLA4. So we thought, why can't we exploit this molecule as a way to actually block PD1, PDL1 interactions? Um, and at the same time, it could deliver an activation signal through CD28 to the T cell. So we get that sort of double whammy effect of blocking suppression through PD1 while simultaneously activating a T cell that may not have been previously activated. Um, it also has the advantage that, PD, that CD80 could bind to PDL1 and prevent that reverse signaling and suppression through CD80. So this then led us to suggest <clears throat> that since CD80 binds to PDL1, it could sterically inhibit the binding of PD1 and prevent PDL1 suppression, um, thereby protecting T cells, T cells from apoptosis, and at the same time bind to CD28 and facilitate T cell activation. And so we did some experiments, and I'm really going into basic lab work here. This is not going to be clinical results. Um, we know in a number of human cells that ex are strong expressors for um, PDL1 that if we take those cells either with or without CD80, that we can actually prevent the binding of PD1 to the cells, as is simply shown here. And if I can do the pointer. So in the absence of CD80, you get PD1 binding. In the presence of CD80, you really don't get PD1 binding. And then the same is true here. Um, this is a, a, a lung squamous cell carcinoma, expresses PDL1. And if you then, again, you bind PD1 in the absence of CD80, but when you have CD80, there's no binding of PD1. So there's clearly a very potent effect and ability of CD80 to prevent the binding of PDL1 to PD1. 
And so <clears throat> we then looked at a number of different um, cell lines. Again, here are two uh, lung cancer cell lines, a bronchial alveolar um, adenocarcinoma, um, as well as the squamous cell carcinoma. And what you can see is if you're comparing here, just looking at activation of your T cells in terms of gamma interferon production, which is really the hallmark of T cell activation, um, you can see that when you have a soluble version of CD80, you get very nice activation. If you have just a control irrelevant molecule, you basically do not get significant activation. So again, the CD80 seems to do a really good job in maintaining the activation of T cells even when you have PDL1 positive tumor cells around. <coughs> The same thing can be said if your T cells express PDL1, and as we mentioned, a number of other cells besides tumor cells can express PDL1. So there are many target cells that could cause this immune suppression. Um, and so what you're looking at here is uh, a situation, again, looking at gamma interferon production by activated T cells in the presence just of irrelevant uh, molecules. You really don't get much activity, but if you then come in with your uh, soluble CD80, you get very nice activity, and in this particular case, you even get better activity than you do when you simply use a PDL1 antibody by itself. So the CD80 really seems to give you that boost of not just blocking the suppression, but at the same time co stimulating and activating your T cells. And so, of course, the obvious question is. Um, is CD80 any better than a whole slew of other antibodies, the antibodies to PDL1 that are out there? And so, simply comparing um, a number of different antibodies, and we've now looked at a total of seven antibodies to PDL1 and seven to PD1. And in all cases, the CD80 gives you a better response in terms of maintaining those T cells in an activated state. So, we can conclude then from the binding studies that we're definitely blocking PD1, PDL1 suppression. Um, and the question then becomes why are we really getting this better response than with antibodies? Is it actually due to co stimulation? And so we did a simple, oops, okay. We did a simple experiment in which we simply blocked the ability of the cells to respond to co stimulation by um, adding very high levels of CD80. And in that case, what you can see happens is that here's a, your suppression by your tumor cells down here versus in the absence of tumor cells, you get nice activation. Um, if you then come in with your CD80 positive cells or soluble CD80, you get that bolus effect. Um, if you then come in with a, um, the antibody, so now we're blocking co-stimulation because it can't bind to CD28, you see you still get a nice activation, but it's not as good as you have up here if you don't block co-stimulation. And if you, if, um, if, if you use an irrelevant control to uh, just control for whatever you're adding here, you see that you get that bolus activation. So really the difference between these two lines is what you're seeing is the activation through co-stimulation through CD80 interacting with CD28, whereas down here what you're seeing is the activation that's due to suppressing PDL1. So you really get that double double feature of having both of those um, both of those responses. And so question then becomes: so does this really do us any good in terms of any clinical material, or were these just simply artifacts of some in vitro experiments that we were doing? So we got together with um, Mojan Amazea and Steve Rosenberg's lab at the NCI, and they're a uh, standard protocol then for adoptive transfer therapy where they take out cells from patients, expand them in vitro, and then re-put them back, do an adoptive transfer, and do a cellular therapy type of, of treatment. Now, Mojgan had various um, patients whose T cells she couldn't expand. And what she notices is that those that had very high levels of PD-1, she could not expand sufficiently in vitro, so they actually couldn't be used for therapy. So we thought maybe what we'll do is we'll take those cells and we'll see what happens if we add our soluble CD80. It's really a construct hooked up to the FC domain of an antibody molecule. And what you can see is just looking at the absolute number of cells in the absence of CD80 in the in vitro expansion, you do get some expansion, but if you include CD80 
in the in vitro expansion, you get about a threefold increase. Well, that's nice, but what's even more nicer <laughs> is that if you look at the quality of those T cells that you get, looking at equal numbers of T cells and looking at the gamma interferon production, you see that when you include the CD80, you get a much higher level of gamma interferon. So this seems like it might be actually a useful approach to expanding ex vivo cells that might actually go back into a patient. And so, of course, the, um, the, the preclinical work in animals, we started, and I really have to preface this by saying that we were shooting totally blind when we studied this. We had no pharmacokinetic information. We had no idea what the half-life of soluble CD80 would be in vivo. We really had no idea when we should dose it. So the first experiments that we did was with a colon carcinoma, and we treated very early um, after introduction of the tumor into the animals. And in this case, we did see some effect. It wasn't a dramatic effect. The line down here is the, um, the CD80. It was better in this particular model, the PD antibody to PDL1 had really no effect. Um, what was a little promising was that if you looked at the surviving mice, um, that the ones that had been on the CD80 therapy were all alive, whereas the other groups really weren't. And if you looked at the tumor weights, um, you could see that the weights for the uh, CD80 treated animals were definitely the lowest. Um, well, this one is also low, but all this is one mouse. All of the other mice in that group had already died. So we then decided um, that perhaps we should try this, the CD80 in combination with, with some other reagents and see if we could do better in a therapeutic setting. And so we combined with the, with the oligo nucleotide um, CPG, which is something that has been used in a number of animal systems to facilitate dendritic cell activation and subsequent T cell activation. And so in this case, we again used the colon carcinoma, but we started much later. We started when these tumors were really quite large for a mouse, uh, six, six and a half millimeters in diameter. And the rationale here was is that, again, PD-1 comes up with T cell activation. So when we were starting very early, perhaps the T cells weren't even PD-1 positive yet. But by this time, when you have a sizable tumor, if there's any kind of T cell infiltrate, the cells should be expressing PD-1. And so what you can see here is looking at the, um, the, the double treatment is the green, where there was really quite a dramatic effect. Um, the CD80 by itself also has an effect, but really not as good as if you combine it with the, uh, with the CPG. Um, and just looking at the individual growth curves for these animals, you can again see that there's really quite a nice effect of that combination therapy that's uh, much better than, than either of the controls. We've also done this with two other mouse tumors, um, B16 and melanoma, which is sort of the card-carrying hard tumor to treat in animals as well as a mammary carcinoma, which is a spontaneously metastatic tumor. And again, you see the same thing, that in all cases, the combo treatment with the uh, CPG plus the CD80 really gives you the best response. Um, this dip down here is due to the fact that um, most of the animals in that group died, and so you're just left with one mouse that has a low tumor load. But again, the point here is, is that the combination really seems to be quite effective. So um, the really, what we were really surprised by, or pleased by really, was that the effect when we looked at the tumors by IHC for CD3 for T cell infiltrates, that the soluble CD80 treated animals really had enormous quantities of T cells infiltrating the tumor, again, as compared to um, either antibody to PDL1 or the other controls. So in summary, we know that CD80 binds to PDL1 and it prevents PD1 binding. We <clears throat> know that it maintains T cell activation in the presence of human tumor cells. I didn't show you the data for mouse, it's the same. Um, it, it, presence of tumor cells that are very high expressors of PDL1, as well as T cells that are high expressors of PDL1. Um, we know that CD80 is more effective than antibodies to PD1 or PDL1, at least the, the 14 antibodies that we've tested in these systems. 
And we know that CD80 is very effective in promoting T cell entry into tumors. And we know that in combination with CPG, it gives really a very nice um, delay in tumor progression. So what I didn't talk about, and I'll just mention very briefly, is that there's also the issue of CD80 binding to CTLA-4. And of course, ipilimumab is a drug that blocks CTLA-4 and gives, again, some immunotherapeutic effect. So we were very worried whether we would see some kind of suppression through CTLA-4. And as I say, I haven't, done, I haven't shown you the experiments, but we know it doesn't because we've done blocking studies for CTLA-4 and actually see absolutely no difference. So what we think is going on here <clears throat> is that the soluble CD80 is probably simultaneously neutralizing PD-L1, PD-1 suppression while it co-stimulates and activates T cells that may not previously have been activated. And we think that that's why it's an improvement over antibodies to either PD-1 and or to PD-L1. And so you can think of it, or at least we think of it, as it's sort of a combination therapy where we're drilling, doing two things at once, um, but we're doing it with a single reagent. And just to acknowledge people who've been involved in this, there have been a number of people in the lab. The work was really started by uh, Ko Bosch and then was taken up by, uh, where are you, by Sammy Haley, Lucas Horn, who's now working on the project along with um, Tia Long and various other collaborators. Thank you. trying to take this board out of animals into humans? I mean, because that looks like part of your next step. Yeah, well, obviously. Um, the project was actually picked up, and I think I had it on the last slide, by Metamune AstraZeneca about a year ago. And so we're really trying to get enough preclinical data to move it into, uh, into the clinic. Your data really would suggest a combination of a PD-1, PD-L1 checkpoint blocker with CD80. And um, I don't know if you can already answer this, but you know we always talk about other differences between PD-1 and PD-L1 agents. Based on your data, can you speculate whether it would be more beneficial to combine CD80 with a PD-1 or a PD-L1 agent? You know, I obviously am, am interpreting your data, but I was wondering if we actually had some data suggesting that maybe PD-1 would be important and you know, related to that, the PD-L2 role. Yeah, I can't really say anything about PDL2, but I think from the point of view of PD1 versus PDL1, since the, the, the suppressive mechanism that's not talked a lot about in the tumor world is the reverse signaling where PDL1 suppresses through CD28 on the tumor cell. And of course, antibody to PD1 will not impact that whereas blocking PDL1 will, supp will suppress that. So that could easily be another reason why we're seeing a better response. So we're really getting three, three things for the price of one drug, right? We're preventing that PDL1 uh, suppression through CD80, we're getting co-stimulation through CD28, and we're blocking PDL1, PD1 interactions. Yeah. Yeah. There are no more questions. Thank you so much, Sue. Uh -huh.